also written articles on those at my website, which is zwilnik.com. So, very cool. More, more information for anyone that wants it. So the whole thought about six months ago, I started sitting down looking at everything that's happening with the privacy concerns and revelations. Uh, so we, uh, I, well, I said I wanted to start looking into how to keep myself private and how to also keep, uh, you know, uh, authenticity, making sure that you know the person you're talking to. Um, so that's where I started studying this, and I do a little uh, security bit on our podcast also. So I, you know, little things about either uh, encryption, GPG, or um, other security concerns that's going on in the week. Uh, So why did PGP and GPG come about? So Phil Zimmerman was sitting there and he saw that the Senate Bill 266 was coming out and, or was being discussed and that was designed to force the manufacturer of secure communications to provide a back door for the US government. And he thought that was a bad thing. So he wanted to you know, put something together that's PGP. It's a pretty good protection. And, um, but you know, Fortunately, the bill was defeated, uh, so PGP was created. Um, and then the open source version is GPG, or the GNU Privacy Guard. And that was created by Werner Cook in 99. Uh, and he was concerned that the PGP was getting a little too commercialized, so he, just, he wanted to work on getting the open version. Yeah, I think at the time, PGP was proprietary. I think Zimmerman opened it up after that, but it was freeware, but it was proprietary code. Right. So the concern was that it wasn't open source, and so GPG came out of that. So, what? How does GPG work? It uses a, a key pair, so there's private and public keys. Uh, with that, there's but it uses both symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So it goes through and uses a symmetric key, or I'm sorry, a symmetric key that encrypts the message, and then asymmetrically encrypts the message using the the keys. So basically, what happens is asymmetric. Or, yeah, asymmetric means one way. So it has one key that it, it encrypts with, <coughs> and symmet. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. No. And, the, and the, really, the issue here is that um, symmetric encryption is not as intensive in your computing resources, so you can, you can run it quickly. The problem that you run into is that, that means that you're sharing the key back and forth. So, you know, I send an email to Matt in a fit of insanity and say, <laughs> uh, Matt, I want you to communicate with me securely I've included in the email my encryption key. <laughs> and, you know, the NSA hoovers it up and then can read everything that we do. So the idea of the asymmetric, public versus private, it gets around that because what you're doing is using a one-way mathematical function. Uh, in this case, it happens to involve uh, multiplying very large prime numbers together. That's called one way because you can multiply them really fast. Figuring out from this huge number what the factors are can be very difficult. Uh, so you create this key pair and the idea is I can take my public key and email that to Matt and say, Matt, here's my public key. Now you can communicate with me. And then when I want to send Kevin an email, I encrypt it with his public key and send it off. And then with my private key, I can decrypt. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> you can either send public keys around or there's key servers that are distributed out on the internet. And mm -hmm. so you can search for any person and grab their public key and then be able to communicate that way. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it's cross-platform, uh, and there's uh, GUI programs available to do this. So it doesn't have to be in Linux or on the command line. Uh, you can do it in Windows and Mac and uh, Android. It's it's all sorts of things available. Do you have a question? Oh, I was just going to say they have plugins for some mail programs. I have a GPG, GPG plug into my Thunderbird for a decade. No one wants to trade messages with me, though, so I haven't actually used it. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, give me an email. We'll do a little bit. So here's a little picture of kind of how it works. So, like, as he said, there's a random uh, numbers generated and encrypts the message and then takes the public key of the person you're sending it to and encrypts that also and then puts it together in one message. And then whenever you go to decrypt it, you, you have the two, the key that's been encrypted, which can be decrypted only by your private key or the person sending, mm -hmm. the recipient's private key. And then now you have that key that was created up here and then you can decrypt the message. Um, and then, so there's a few ways to set it up, and I specify, or I um, talk about Linux on here because it's my big thing. Uh, but like I said, there's GUI programs for Windows. Yeah. Um, and there's also GUI programs for Linux. Uh, so you can go through yeah. and set up, it, you can create keys, you can sync it back to the, the key servers, and um, you know, in the, in Mint, these are the three key servers that are set up by default. The Ubuntu key servers, SKS and PGP. Uh, but the key servers all propagate across each other. So if you send it to one, then Ubuntu is also going to get your public key. And you only send your public key out. You always keep your private key private. So, Tony, where are these key servers? Who owns those? Where, you know, They're um, owned by the the community. I mean, there's public and private companies that run them. Uh, I'm not the answer to that. Um, anybody can run one, actually. And it doesn't matter who has them because, like they said, nobody can use them to. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, all, to there's a reason it's only your public, public key that's ever on them, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. The yeah. whole goal is to make the public key known to the world. Right. 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 So the it, more you broadcast it, the better it is. It, it's like DNS. All right. Anyone can have a DNS server. You could set up one for your home if you wanted to, and it would simply sync with other DNS servers and get all the updates. Well, the same thing with key servers. They they talk to each other. So um, I think uh, I, I, mine is uh, GPG. Okay. Yeah, I send mine up to SKS. But MIT so has really one that is frequently used by a lot of people, but there's it, it doesn't really matter. Right. You know. the, the whole thing about a public key is it's supposed to be public. I mean, you could take out an ad in the newspaper and print out your public key yeah. there and tell the world here's what it all is. All it's good for is to send you an encrypted to email. To send me a message. That you will then be able to uh, And In fact, uh, I'm probably going to put it on my website when I just have the time to be, you know. Yeah. Uh, something I've been meaning to do for a while now is, is put it up there. Right, and you don't have to put the entire key. You can just put the fingerprint, and we'll talk about that on here. And um, mm -hmm. so because you're going to go grab that key off the key server. But uh, Seahorse is the default for GNOME, and, uh, and all GNOME variants, so like uh, Cinnamon and Monte. Um, uh, and if it's not installed, this is how you would go about installing it on a yeah. Debian system. And uh, KDE would be KGPG. Right? Mary, you're, no, there we yep. go. I knew you were here somewhere. <laughs> yep, KGPG. That's what Mary and I use. Uh, and then there's command line tools also, yeah. which is the, the GPG. Um, and it was installed by default. And, uh, you know, if you want to go to my website, that, uh, zwilnik.com. Um, I've got step by step on how to do it with command line or a GUI and just take you right through it from start to finish. You know, my hangout just died. And this happened last time I was given this presentation. I think they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> You've been censored. Uh, that's right. So, uh, and this is how, you, if you want to go through the, the command line, I'm going to skip. I, I'm not going to go into details on the, the command line stuff, but I threw in a couple of the uh, commands on how to go through and creating keys and 
Um, and it, there's, this is the key, the command to start it. And there's quite a few prompts after it. Like ask for your name and a comment and um, a yeah. bunch of other information about your email addresses. Right, and it generates the key with a combination of some random numbers and the stuff that you put in. So your, your name, your email address, your comment, all of that is part of it. In fact, your email address is associated with the key. So right. one of the things people recommend, if you have a number of different email addresses that you use for different purposes, you might not want to use one key. You might want to have one for each email address, uh, you know, depending on how much you want people to know about your keys. So okay. is that email address and information provided, published? Yeah, or it's is published this? in the public key. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's in the search, key. You can search for people by their email address, okay. so, by their name, or by the fingerprint. You know, if someone takes a look at your public key and you've got six different email addresses, they now know all of those email addresses, which maybe you didn't want them to, maybe one of them was where you work, and that's a different thing. Yep. So I just mentioned it. So one thing I, when I created mine, is it asked for a, um, a little nay or your nickname. So I put Tony the Gray. I didn't realize that was on the public key that everybody could see. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. When you create your key, a couple of considerations. The, the first, uh, you can see here, uh, Tony selected to change the screen on me. <laughs> <laughs> 2048 bit. It's bad. Um, so you've got some options as to how strong a level of encryption you're going to employ. Uh, at this point, uh, 1024, it just doesn't really provide any protection. You, you want to skip over that altogether. Next level up would be 2048. Obviously, we're doing powers of two here. Uh, that's what I use. Um, NIST says that should be good until about the year 2030 is their estimate. Um, I, I don't think they're lying. I think they're somewhat tarnished by what happened with the elliptical curve <coughs> encryption where the NSA came in and seems to have uh, pushed everything in a very weak direction. Uh, and that they're always denying that there was any intent to put in a back door, but they've since revoked that elliptical curve uh, key and uh, moved on from that. But I think that's probably reasonable. You could go the next step up would be 4096, and I know people who do that. Uh, bear in mind that the stronger the encryption, the higher the bit rate that you're putting in. The, the more computationally intensive it'll be. So maybe it'll take a little bit longer for your messages to encrypt and decrypt. You know, you can try it out and see. Uh, but right now, Tony and I are both using 2048, and I'm pretty comfortable. Uh, I, I haven't seen any evidence yet that says 2048-bit keys have been compromised in general. Yeah. So I skipped that a little bit, I'm sorry. What you want to do, when you're doing the command line stuff, you want to put this in, you want to export that into your uh, your bash uh, RC. And what happens, you stick the key ID right here. So anytime you're dealing with GPG and you want to specify a key that you're going to be working with, if you always want to say, this is my key, or do it against this key, my key, then you put your, your key ID, which is the last eight of the fingerprint, you put it in there, and then anytime uh, we'll go through here. When you're encrypting, decrypting, you don't have to type out your fingerprint each time for your uh, the last eight. Mm -hmm. The key ID, you can just put GPG. Uh, <coughs> like right here. If you want to send the GPG key servers, you specify the key server, and then you put here, and then it knows to grab your key. Yeah. One other thing I'd like to mention, though, about generating a key is the passphrase. Because oh. you have to create a passphrase when you do this. And... Uh, this is really crucial for security. I mean, if you're going through all of this, presumably you want to be secure. Otherwise, this is a big pain in the neck for no gain. Uh, well, you know, that passphrase is important then uh, because if someone gets a hold of your private key, the one that only you know, if they can guess or crack your password, then 
they can read everything that was uh, supposed to be private and encrypted. That's right. So, and don't forget it. <laughs> if you forget it or lose the it, problem you that you run it. into here is that you have to either create one that is sufficiently complex that it's not easy to crack, but at the same time that you can remember and type in, because when you're using uh, these keys, you have to enter your passphrase every time if you want to have security. So Tony sends me an email and I want to decrypt it, what is going to happen is GPG is going to say, well, you got this uh, encrypted email, do you want to read it? Tell me your passphrase. Longer is better. But, you know, you're going to have to balance length versus the fact that you have to do it every time. Is there a character limit? Not that I know of. You mean it's not eight up case characters? <laughs> <laughs> I think in terms of a pass. No, but it reminds me of a joke <laughs> of a, a user, and uh, one of the sysadmins goes and says, um, "Excuse me, but why is it that your password is Grumpy Sneezy Dopey Dog Blah 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 Sacramento?" And it's like, well. Eight characters in the capital. <laughs> <laughs> so you also want to back up your keys in case something happens to your laptop or your computer. You have your keys on. You can, uh, if you lose your private key, then you can no longer decrypt those messages. So you want to make sure you have a backup and keep that backup secure. Um, again, this is all stuff through the the command mm -hmm. line, and you can do all these same things in the GUI. Uh, or the graphic interfa interface, uh, and you can also imp then import those keys back in from your backup. Right now, you know, we say keeping it secure. Um, when you export keys, and there are times you'd want to do that uh, if you want to move from one computer to another. So okay, I, I set up my key here, but you know now I want to use it on this other computer or my phone or what have you. You export the key that creates an ASCII text file. Uh, obviously, anyone can read an ASCII text file, right? So, uh, let's say you export your key as an ASCII text file. You put it on your phone because you say, hey, I want to be able to do encryption on my phone. And you've got uh, APG on there, Android Privacy Guard. And you import the key and say, great, now I've got... This is the point where you stop and say, I've still got that ASCII file on my phone. Uh, I believe the current, they're, they're, be, they're arguing this right now in front of the Supreme Court, whether you have any right to privacy on what's on your phone. But right now, they're pretty much saying, oh yeah, the cops can just take your phone and read anything on it. No, they can't. My phone's encrypted. <laughs> well, right. and, and one thing that AGP does is when you import it, then there's a little option saying delete the, that, uh, the key that you're importing. And you want to delete that file so that yeah. somebody can just grab your phone and copy that key off and use it again somewhere else. So, you know, think about when we say, you know, keep it safe. Um, I see people say, print it out and give a copy to your lawyer or something like that. You know, put it in a safe deposit box. No, because your lawyer could be compelled to give that up. <clears throat> give it to your pastor. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you can go through, if, if you use the, with the GPG key, uh, if you use uh, the dash C, then it's using a passphrase to encrypt the file, it's not using your key. So you can then give the person whatever passphrase you, you did it, they'd be able to decrypt it. It's like sharing. So, yeah, it, it's, it's like sharing it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you use it with the E, then it's encrypting it for you, and only you can decrypt it with your key. It's, uh, and then to, for decrypting, it, it creates, when it's, when you encrypt it, it creates another file with this .gpg extension. When you encrypt the file on your computer, and then it creates the other file on your computer, does it delete the first file? No, the first file is still there. Is there a switch that can do that? I assume there is. I do not know. No, there's not. You've got to delete it. Of course. 
Uh, so then you can go through and you can also sign it. So the dash S is just sign. So the other part of, uh, of GPG is verifying the person you're talking to. Uh, so that's what I, I have when I send out emails. By default, I put my signature on every email so that people know who's, uh, you know, it's actually coming from me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, I can just uh, comment on the uh, decrypting files. Um, I, and I always forget which way it is, but I believe if you don't actually do it with, with the dash D, it would uh. decrypt it. But instead of writing a file, it's in the standard app. Oh, okay. Or, or, the, or the reverse, I always forget. And, and I find it's very useful when the. So you can just see it one time and. Well, uh, well you're already doing it with the script. Go ahead, you can set your script up, go ahead, type your password, decrypt the file where you have the information, of course, something out of it. The file never even stays because of the file system. That's a good idea. Um, and then, if you want to sign an encryptor for a specific person, you say, you know, E for encryption, S to sign, and then R is who the recipient is, and then the person you're sending it to. And that's the name uh, that's in the, that you have their public key. Uh, you know, then that creates. Right, so there's two different keys being employed here, right? Correct. For yes. the encryption, it's got to be Matt's key because we're sending a file to Matt. For the signing, it's Tony's key because he's signing it saying, yeah, this is me and this is the proof that it's me. So it's actually using two different keys in there. So you, what you want to do is you want to get your key signed because it's the whole web of trust idea. It's, it's a big thing here. What you want to do is say, Kevin signs my key, Matt mm -hmm. signs my key, Mary signs my key. Then anybody that knows Matt and says, you know, if Matt knows him, then maybe I'll trust him too. So he can sign my key or he can know. Or he doesn't have to sign my key, but he can verify that there's more than one person actually knows who I am. Uh, and then the more people you get to sign in. Not necessarily more. knows who you are, but knows, can and verify that that key is associated yeah. with you. Yes, because anybody can create a key with any name right up. Right, correct. If somebody signs it and you trust them, then you believe that they somehow verify that the key they sign belongs to you. Right. Which would, leads me to believe that Oh, that whole web of trust thing is getting weaker because more people are using it. There's not as many key signing parties. How many in-person key signings are there actually occurring? Uh, there's one occurring here at five yeah. o'clock in this yeah. room. But how many that's are just how many are just occurring via email? Why you you know? Who you trust? Uh, yeah. Sir. Uh, I do a CA cert web of trust thing, which is similar because they also will sign keys right. for you. And we've done PenguinCon for the last three or four years. We've had a CA cert with a key signing party attached to it. And I have actually been contacted out of the blue by people who wanted to have their CA cert stuff certified. Mm -hmm. Just out of the blue at least once a year for the last five years. So that's happened. And so the, the, there's a difference between the CA certs and, and the GPG keys because CA certs is more of a centralized you are certification. Who you say you are. Right. There's somebody out there who says this person is actually him. Yeah. Where this one is saying that this key belongs to the person who claims theirs, as opposed to saying I am who I'm claiming to be. So right. they're related in certain terms of the web, but they're using different technologies. Sorry, so you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, has anybody tried to come up with a, a system similar to notary publics to, to uh, sign keys? You know, um, you go into your bank, you have the notary public. That would be the CA system. I was about to say that's CAs. That's, it's, uh, it's things that whenever you go to an uh, encrypted or uh, HTTPS website. Right, yeah, I know how that works. Well, there's, I don't uh, there's an organization that says this is actually Google. And so they they do, and that's like a more centralized thing. But as oh, for like individuals yeah. signing, that's what GPG, the, the idea is decentralized. You don't have, you know, two or three big companies. Right, but no republics are kind of a decentralized mechanism. You know, mm -hmm. you can go to a notary public in any bank, for example. But they're actually not decentralized. 
because they then have to be licensed. Yeah, they do have to be licensed. C CA authorities play the same way. You decide what CA authorities you trust. Right. So really, they, anybody they can create a number of them do delegate to CAs. There, there's multiple CAs, and it's only the big ones that get into the web browsers that um, then uh, you trust. Because I mean, anybody can create their own uh, keys for their own web server. But if you don't get your key onto a CA, pay for it, right. then it doesn't get recognized. Right, it's the pay for it part that is still a big um, There are a couple of CAs that do it for free, but then you have to tell the people how to insert the CA into right. the web browser because right. so the builder doesn't actually right. and add I'm, it to their official CA list. And I'm thinking of something for use as a GEG key rather than for use as, you know, in a browser. Um, you know, if I can go to a notary and have them sign my key, I'll you know, show my driver's license and show that you know I am me, and they'll attach their signature to it, saying yes, I I checked this one off. Right. Um, you know, that would be a, a one-time thing. You're not uh, you don't need the whole certificate infrastructure. It is just key signing. Well, as being decentralized, I don't see a problem with the actual notary doing that. I mean, because that's the notary can sign it, and then whenever you go to look up somebody's key on the website uh, or through the, it shows everybody that signed your key. So if somebody's on there says you know they're a registered notary, then that would give you more cred that you had a registered notary that signed your key. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any kind of. As far as I know, that I don't, I don't know of anything like that. I, yeah. Well, why couldn't you use a real notary? Just piece right, that's print right. it off on a piece of paper, right? Take right. it to them. Yeah. Well, the thing is, then you have to distribute that, and that's what the key servers are for. Um, so, key signing parties. What you do is you get together, you print off your uh, your fingerprint, and again, this is how you do it in the command line. And then you walk around with your fingerprint, and uh, you know everybody gets together, and generally you do this offline, not with your computer, because it's likely if you're around a, a bunch of techies that your computer's going to get hacked. So you, you walk around with pieces of paper, you hand it out, and then everybody goes back to their computer at home, and then you go through and sign the keys later. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, what you want to do is you meet up and you verify with a, uh, a recognized identification, so like driver's license, passport, you know, whatever your organization or your group of people you're meeting with recognizes that that's actually you. Um, so, and then once you sign the keys on your computer, then you go, you sync your the, those keys that you signed back up to the key server. Then and then it's distributed, and everybody can see that you've signed those keys. So, Tony, uh, we're, we're sort of orientating the conversation about individuals. How do large corporations make sure that the you know admin that is managing managing that uh, that server is who's putting the cert in there is really the appropriate person to do that. I would think that would be internal policies. You're that talking certs or keys? They're different. Okay, so I suppose the keys. It doesn't matter because the person who signed it is signing it with their encrypt with their key. So if you trust that person. It's fine. If you don't trust them, then the fact that they signed it is useless. So if you want to sign my key, here it is. Yeah. This is this is the entire fingerprint, and the key ID is the last eight. Um, if you you can distribute the last eight, but there's a possibility that other people have that last eight. So it's best to send the whole fingerprint. Let's prevent uh, two of us from getting in. Dark alley somewhere, and being Confederate and signing keys for people that we, we definitely are not. <coughs> what do you mean? Let's say uh, we want to sign up and say, I, I am Kevin O'Brien today, uh, because that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, so you would create your own key? Yes, exactly. Uh, that's one of the downfalls of, um, of GPG. Well, then you'd have to trick a bunch off. of people into signing yeah. it, though. True. If you did that, it'd probably become known real quickly, and nobody would then trust <laughs> you. Understood. Understood. Yeah, well, you know, think about what has to happen here. 
you create a key saying you're Kevin O'Brien. Yes. What can be done with that? You publish a public key, just as I've done. Someone will grab that key and use it to send me email. And then I get the email and say, I can't open this. Which has happened to me a couple yeah, of times right. where someone sent me something and said, I can't